นะโมทัสสะภะคะวะโทอะระหะโทสัมมาสัมพุทธัสสะนะโมทัสสะภะคะวะโทอะระหะโทสัมมาสัมพุทธัสสะปุถังธัมมังสังฆังธรรมสาม
uh, the society we live in, very much a society where we, we, we gossip and we read about what other people do, and especially about what they do wrong. As I said before, it'd be to write a story about a Buddhist monk who was a really good Buddhist monk, kept all the rules, practiced hard, wouldn't be such an interesting story, would it? If you had a, Buddha, a story about a Buddhist monk that broke all the rules. Did outrageous, scandalous things. You might have a bestseller. Now just bear with this retreat as, as you as you um, they as it goes on. This is only the second complete day, and to to resolve to to make a resolve to stay for the whole retreat. And this is. Uh, to be, to, in order that you will, you, you determine to put up with and endure that which before you thought you can't, or you don't, or you wouldn't endure or bear with. It's very important to to know how much you can take. We can take a lot more than we think we can. It's always the case. I've never seen that to fail. If we Sometimes the vo- inner voices are going, I can't stand another minute of this, but we can always stand another minute. Yeah. I'm fed up. I can't take it anymore, but we can always take it more, take more. It's amazing what we can endure, and yet there's that, those inner voices that say, I can't take it anymore, I've had enough, I can't bear it, too much. Don't believe them. We're pretty tough, resilient creatures, and we can take an, a lot. But those those emotions and that can go on and scream away and rant and rave and complain, and but those are the conditioning of the mind based on ig- from through ignorance and fear, desire. So they're not to be trusted. Patience very much is a matter of learning to be with the feeling of life. Because when we think about life very much intellectually, we become very impatient with it. And the more kind of intellectual you you tend, you incline to that, and rational and uh, these these tendencies will always make you very impatient with the way life tends to actually be for most of us most of the time. We can create a vision very quickly or in the in the head of a ideal society, but to actually know how to create an ideal society takes generations, doesn't it? How to how to move toward that ideal, rather. I mean, like the communists, uh, say, the, since the Russian Revolution in 1917, idea of creating a perfect society in the Soviet Union, communist society. And it's far from perfect, even now, after, what, 60, 70 years, 70 years. And the way they do it isn't very wise, isn't it? They're trying to force the situation, slaughter all the people, the the royalty, the 
wealthy, the rich farmers, uh, just anything that gets in your way, you just wipe it out. So you can you can move toward this ideal, the, a perfect communist system where everything is equal, everything is shared, everything is is just what we can imagine it should be. But of course, that will never happen because the the way they go about doing things is always doing it in the wrong way. You can't get a perfectly fair, just, merciful, and equal society if you're using violent means, if you're persecuting, destroying, annihilating anything. All you can get is is a, a lot of tyranny and fear, paranoia, from murder and violence. There's no way you're going to get a peaceful and truly communist society through purging or violence. Like what's happening in Sri Lanka now, trying to get, the Tamils trying to get uh, their a separate country for themselves through violence. And so everything gets upset. The ir- Iraq and Iran in Lebanon, Israel, Soviet Union, the United States. Only the human nature so far only knows how to threaten and force and tyrannize. And yet contemplating Dhamma or the way things are, one begins to discover a new way of doing things. You realize that Rather than a revolution, we need more of an evolutionary attitude. That things change and move, and that if we guide them in the right way, according to the harmony, the true harmony of of nature, learning to understand and listen, to be sensitive to the way things actually are, then things flow and move and change in in a in a skillful way. When we disrupt them through violent revolution and so forth, then they change in a very unpleasant way. And how could you have anything else but fear, paranoia and tyranny if your means is violent? Even if you think you're doing violence for the for a good result, the result, as I say, result justifies the means. But in the Buddhist understanding of the way things are, they say that the, that the means is the important thing. When we talk about karma, the means we use has to be in the the, the proper means for the result. You can't use a violent means and get a peaceful result. You're going to get a violent result. Now apply that to your mind, just to examine how this works in your mind. If you're if you're trying to for to get rid of things and purge and annihilate things and suppress uh, you're going to become a tyrant. You're going to feel tyrannized, an inner tyranny will arise. If you're violent, repressive, annihilating to yourself, you feel you, the result, now this is to be noticed, you feel tyrannized, oppressed, frightened, anxious. Now when we use the right means, uh, notice I've been in, in stressing the use of of brightening the mind, of of gentle, uh, a kind of gentle attitude of goodwill, peacefulness. The actual form we use isn't a violent form, is it? Even though it's restraint, restrained and limited, it's based on moral restraints, and the limitations are are. Are not to torture or or, uh, or or annihilate anything, but to 
provide a uh, uh, say some a situation where we we don't have the the freedom and the opportunity to go outward very much. We're actually in almost forced and encouraged to go inward. Now the restraints and the, and the moral restraints, and these are voluntary. They have to be from your choice. If if I impose restraints on you against your will, that's that's not going to have a good result either. It's something that you have to 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 choose. It comes from your willingness to do so. For example, monastic life, you have to choose to be a monk or not. It, does, it should never be forced on anyone. When, when anything is forced on someone, then it, it no longer, it, like that for the holy life, this definitely has to be something that we, we choose to do ourselves. In Buddhist countries, sometimes the it's uh, social pressure, like in Sri Lanka, oftentimes the, the idea of, of once you're ordained as a monk, you can't disrobe. Social pressure. So that the, the idea of, of remaining a Buddhist monk for the rest of your life, you don't like it. You're just forced to be that way. So you don't really, you, you don't, you're not really using the the, the conditions for what they're meant to be used for. So you get corruption and so forth because of that. Now, concentrating, putting one's attention on the heart area, on feeling, on the uh, on the solar plexus. Now, you, you, one can use various means of, say, brightening the mind. We, when we go to the heart, we're going. We're not expecting to, to make it anything, according, but to just put bring sustain our attention on that part of our body. Now when we're with, strange enough I find, when, when, when my attention is there, the, the self-consciousness goes away. Because self-consciousness very much seems to come from, from the head, where one is, is thinking about how one looks, about whether people, whether I'm people like me or don't like me and so forth. But when you're with the heart, that tends to fall away, that, that tendency. There's a general peacefulness that one feels when, when one isn't caught in self-consciousness. Now self-consciousness is a very painful experience, isn't it? We're always worried about what other people think of us, how we look, whether people like us or don't like us. There are so many ways we can compare ourselves with others, whether we're better, equal, or worse than. Self-consciousness takes us over at an early age, doesn't it? When, when, it, in, when we're, Especially when we enter school. Young children aren't very self-conscious, are they? They tend to... to, uh, to um, be quite innocent, and then through uh, 
through social pressure and peer group identity and and values, social values, and 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 especially in a competitive system where one is is uh, rewarded or punished according to one's achievement. Self-consciousness come, uh, is from ignorance, from identity with the body, with the appearance of the body, with the whether it's attractive or unattractive, male or female, black or white, tall or short, fat or thin. But in with with the heart. That it doesn't matter anymore, does it? We're not thinking about the, the, the thoughts aren't concerned anymore with how we look and what people think of us and the views we have because we're with the actual feeling, with the way things feel. Now, in Buddhist teaching, feeling is is. Uh, is a result of birth. Being born means that we feel. We have feelings, and so we and and we have to f- and we're going to feel the rest of our life. We're going to have these feelings the rest of our life because this is this is what birth it really means that we we are put forth in in a in a sensitive feeling form for a lifetime as a separate being isn't it when we're, we're, we're feeling things like how what I'm feeling seems quite uh, personal and quite separate I don't don't know how you're feeling what you're feeling what how it feels for you but I can feel from this this thing here, this position here, this being here, and it will always be like this for the rest of this life, because that's the way it is. So feeling is 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 the result of birth. Being born, we we are going to feel. Now, when we begin to look at feeling more and more as it, as it is, rather than interpreting it as and reacting to it when we begin to accept it for what even painful feeling pleasant feeling happy sad elated depressed beautiful ugly feeling whatever it is when we know it for what it is then we then there's no desire because desire, the word desire in Buddhist terms, is is what we create out of ignorance as a reaction to the feelings that we're experiencing. So when we don't understand the feelings we're experiencing and we're, we're, we're taking them all in the wrong way and we, we're reacting to them, then we have desires, don't we, on the personal level. We want... I want to be happy, I don't want to be sad, I want to look at beautiful things, I don't want to see ugly things, I want uh, to have good food, I don't want to have bad food, I want people to like me, I, I don't want to be disliked, I want to be successful, I don't want to be a failure, I want the best, I don't want the worst. So the the personal view takes over and we it gets very, very complicated. Some people are better, and some people are worse. Some people are are, are wealthier, um, they're higher status. Some people are lower status. Some people are poorer, older and younger, and the infinite kind of uh, comparisons can go on on the personal plane. And all because of desires we want we want to be happy, we don't want to be we don't want to suffer. Wanting to become something. 
not wanting to have things, uh, conditions now that we don't like. If something's unpleasant now, we want to get rid of it, want to annihilate it, get away from it. We want to become something. How many of you want to become something else? You're not content with the way you are and the way things are. You, you are desiring to become something else other than what, what it is now. The desire to become is very strong in the, in the human condition. The desire for sense, sense desires, sensual desires, at least they're, they're ple- we would like to have all the pleasant sensual experiences, wouldn't we? It'd be nice to have only pleasant sensual experiences. Good weather, beautiful scenery, pleasant bodily feelings, pleasant, beautiful music to listen to, delicious food, fragrant odors. So there's the desire for sense pleasures, desire to become something, and desire to get rid of something. And all that comes as a reaction to feeling alone, the way things feel. Now, when you can begin to see and accept feeling for what it is, whatever way it is, because it changes, then there's one. There's no need to desire it to be otherwise, because one has accepted. One is not not complaining or demanding or or trying to change it, but accepting, noticing, adapting, and then then we te- we respond to these feelings with wisdom rather than with ignorance. Now this is what we can do in this lifetime as a human being. We can respond to life with wisdom rather than with ignorance. With ignorance, it's not really a response, it's a reaction. If it's attractive, we want it. If it's ugly, we don't want it. If it's pleasurable, we, we grasp. If it's, un, if it's painful, we reject. Just like that, we we just our life is a sen- is a reaction to the sense plane, to the emotional feeling of life. Getting in touch with your feelings means that your, your, your feelings aren't uh, uh, like ideas. Ideas are are very nice because you can you have a sense of once you have a good idea, you can. You can bring it up in your mind whenever you want. Isn't it? You, can, you have rational thoughts and altruistic uh, views and, and ideals and all this. One can get, get very inspired with them. You think of, let's work for the welfare of all human beings, all beings everywhere. Let's sacrifice ourselves and and let's build a perfect society where there's true equality and justice and mercy. Where the lion lies down with the lamb, the cat with the dog. Where there's perfect harmony with nature. We just have organic food and water wheels and, and natural things and natural organic pure no chemicals added. The utopian paradise where, where everybody is happy, everybody is youthful, every, everybody is singing songs, the sun shines, We can we can think of we can fantasize, can't we, about a, a kind of utopian in the future someday we'll we'll live in, in this utopian paradise. Ideas are 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 something you can you you can uh, live with. You can bring them up when you get bored or deluded or I mean depressed and and you can and you can inspire the mind with ideas. Sometimes that's what we want. We? We're not 
content with life. We're not with life as we're, as we're feeling it. We want to be inspired by something. We seek inspiration. We want to get elated, get high, get enthusiastic, zealous. And the more we seek just a, a diet of inspiration and and, and enthusiasm, be it uh, inspiring inspiration on the high plane of moral conduct and the highest, most altruistic values, we're also going to get the opposite. That the more altruistic, high-minded you tend to be, the more you will suffer from depression, extreme depression, anxiety. Because uh, elation and depression work together. If you're attached to be getting high, you're going to also get low. Now this is for reflection, I keep, I keep emphasizing. That just attaching to ideas and then living in a world of fantasies and, and inspiration is not enough. Ideals are, are necessary for us, admittedly, not to, to say we shouldn't have ideals or we shouldn't be altruistic. But we need to know exactly what that function is in life and its limits and not grasp it, not depend on it, because it cannot truly satisfy us either. To live in a world of high-minded ideas only takes us to disappointment, despair, cynicism, bitterness. Every cynic was probably a very high-minded idealist at one time. With feeling, it's how things are now. Isn't it? It, it doesn't, we're not, we're not going to be inspired by, by feeling necessarily. It's just the way it is. We're not asking, we're not expecting to be inspired. We read books and we, we hear talks and we, we seek inspiration from, from uh, on the intellectual plane. But on the feeling plane, they bring your attention to the way life actually feels. As you're feeling it, not, not from an idea of how it should feel, but the way it actually feels. And this, you have to, to open yourself to, the way you're feeling life. But no longer interpreting that the feeling is personal, making it and judging it from, from the standards, intellectual standards or altruistic standards you have about how you should feel, what should a woman feel and a man feel, and what, uh, we have we have certain high standards of what we of what a man or woman or mother or father or son or daughter should be but this we're abiding with feeling accepting the feeling is no longer from the position of should but from the way it is not, not, and so this is this is uh, demands honesty and willingness to accept the way things are, even if it's not in tune or in alignment with our ideals. Which doesn't mean that we settle for inferiority, because we're not asking you to change your ideals to be to have ideals of mediocrity and inferiority that you're attached to. <laughs> some sloppy ideas you have. It doesn't matter. You might as well just do the best you can. Get what you can out of life. You're too idealistic. You expect too much. You want the best. You can't have the best. you just got to get what you can. If you don't get it, somebody else will get it. So you might as well get it first. <laughs> That's not feeling either, is it? Uh, that's, that uh, is a, a miserable kind of settling for something inferior. Mm. 
but attention to feeling, awareness of feeling, say in the heart, in the, in the body itself, this will allow us to develop patience. Because there's no way you can make feelings something other than what they are. Oftentimes they're uh, the feeling of loneliness or sadness or anxiety or fear. These things, we, you know, I, I, uh, on the intellectual plane, on the ideal, you think, I don't want these. I don't want fear. I don't want to be frightened. A normal, healthy man or woman shouldn't be frightened, should they? We shouldn't be frightened of anything. A man shouldn't be frightened of anything. Should be brave all the time. You admit that you're frightened of something means you're that you're a weakling. So that that in, when we are aware, when there is an awareness of, of uh, that we are frightened or anxious. If we're measuring it with how we should be, then of course we have to repress it, deny it, not accept it. But when we're, we're no longer measuring it with, with the ideal, it doesn't mean we don't have the ideal, but we recognize that we're not, we're not trying to, to compare it with the ideal, but learn to be honest about it and accept it the way it is. Because in reality, that's the only thing we can do with it. That's, that's skillful. Trying to make yourself un, unafraid by suppressing fear is certainly not the way, is it? You can just pretend, you know, stiff upper lip, I'm not afraid. Very brave. And we can, we can kind of now, through affirmation and so forth, we can maybe convince ourselves, but we know we're lying. We know that we just we're still frightened. So when we, when there is that sense of fear or anxiety, go to the actual physical feeling of it. Don't make it personal, like saying it. I'm afraid or I'm frightened, but really there is this fear. There is anxiety. What is it like? What does it feel like? And that's what the body is, is a very good uh, object to turn because it, it is a feeling condition from birth to death. Now the wonderful thing is that when you accept feeling then you're, you're no longer a victim of desire. When, when you accept feelings of fear, they can cease. But you're not accepting them with the idea that they're of making them cease because that's, you're willing to accept them even if they don't cease. You're willing to be patient. You're willing to forbear, endure. These are the words most important in, in developing meditation. To be able to endure what we think we can't endure, to bear that which we can't, which we think we cannot bear. I used to, I noticed when, they, just say that like this was an ex experiment I did years ago when I was a monk with Ajahn Chah in Thailand. And they had this long dining hall with rows, monks sat on each side. It was a very narrow hall with, uh, uh, and we sat on in the rows of monks on each side of the hall. And during this time, it was, we, we'd, uh, we'd have to this, those of us who were junior monks would pass out the food. They'd bring in the food and it'd be in big kind of pots. And you'd ladle this food out in the, into the alms bowls and, and you'd go up 
you know, the senior monks would sit toward the front on both sides, and then you'd have to join to, uh, and uh, pass out this food. Well, I didn't like this at all. I didn't like doing this. But I had to. I mean, it was something I did, but I didn't enjoy it. Because it was such a worry. I was so worried all the time that there wouldn't be enough for the last monk. Or that I... that And, and also when you're... When you're passing out food, you're, you know, you, you get some strong vibrations from various monks. The food brings up a lot of strange passions in people's <laughs> minds. I remember having a few myself. There was one monk, Thai monk, who used to take the this kind of uh, powerfully strong sauce made out of fermented fish and, and spiced with chilies, a very powerful flavor. And he used to take this and he'd take a spoon and he'd dip it in and then he'd just splatter it into your arms bowl because it would cover everything. <laughs> and me, such a gentle, kindly character, had could feel certain murderous impulses. <laughs> Over something as silly as that, <laughs> and yet uh, certain I, I could see how, if you didn't have some control over yourself, you'd, we'd be at each other's throats. So that, anyway, I I wouldn't think of doing anything like that. I was I was really kind of worried about it. I might offend somebody, I might upset somebody if I accidentally put the the curry with something they didn't want it on or whatever. So that I found the whole thing uh, a bit of a chore. And then one day I, I started just looking, say, just while I was passing out this food, rather than being up here worrying and, and making it into a terrible problem for myself, I, I, I decided I'd just look at my, I'd concentrate more on the heart. So I started do that, I'd be, I could, you know, I could certainly see and do things just as well, but be here rather than up here. And I found out it, everything went very well. It was, was no, it was quite a nice thing to have done. And that was just, just the changing from, from being up in the head with all the worries and self that, that, uh, that go on up there in relationship to other people. Toward being here, where it's just the feeling and the acceptance of, of the way things are, and just being here, the, the sense of me doing something and them who might not like what I'm doing, that wasn't even part of it anymore. It was just this action of distributing food as in, in its pure form without me doing it and wondering whether I'm everybody's satisfied or if there's going to be some complaints or. <laughs> So then I thought, well, that that worked, didn't it? Actually, I didn't mind doing it that morning. It was quite nice thing to do. Well, then, for you to 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 experiment in that way, move more. If you stay up with the, your ideas about yourself and the and the shoulds and the shouldn'ts, musts and the mustn'ts, oughts and ought nots, and what people think and say and all those, then you then life is a, a complicated and difficult, and so much of it is just a worry for us, isn't it? It can only be a worry and a burden. Now, being with the feeling, even the pain is bearable. For example, I did some experiments with physical pain. I thought, well, if at first I just I just tried to suppress. I, my first uh, when I first started meditating, I'll just ignore it, and I'll try to get concentrated so that. I won't even notice the pain anymore. If I just concentrate my mind, 
then I won't feel it anymore. It'll be out of consciousness. And so there was this tremendous a kind of anxiety and fear of pain actually present, but but never really recognized or never really accepted as a feeling. Just the idea that I shouldn't react to pain up here in the head. You should you should sit still and you shouldn't react to pain. You should just use your willpower not to react to it. But it was all from up here. My ideas of what I should do in regard to pain. And of course, it created more pain. I mean, because you're getting tense and nervous, you're just sitting there, and pretty soon you're about ready to, you, you know, you can't stand it anymore. And I used to feel angry all the time, right? because the, this, I, the way I, this the kind of American attitude of you can't show that you can't take it, so you sit there. Oh. And then I would feel hatred for everything. And so, if Ajahn Chah was talking and and I was in agony, I hated him. And all the months I could hate everybody, just because I was, I didn't want to move. I didn't want them to know that I couldn't take the pain. So I was hating, <laughs> hating all these nice people. Well, this certainly is not the holy life. <laughs> <laughs> so the, then I became aware that if you actually put your attention on the physical sensation <coughs> of pain and of course there was a strong aversion to it wanting to get away from it that, that sensation say if you had ba- uh, sore knees pain in your knees so that I uh, I began to just concentrate more on the on the sensation of it, and I found out that that physical sensation of pain is uh, most of them are bearable. If you're willing to totally accept and not make any add anything to it. Now, down at Chitters, we several years ago, I had to have my teeth fixed. I'd, I had to have uh, my two front teeth had to be recapped. They were broken when I was young and so that, that uh, they had these caps that were made in Thailand about 20 years ago and they were beginning to fall off. And I remember that year I went on a, a, a lecture tour up in Scotland and one of my caps kept falling off my teeth. <laughs> and this kind of ugly gap here. <laughs> and one time I almost lost it. I went into a right panic. <laughs> give a talk. The, the cap's falling off your teeth. So somebody offered to, to um, pay for some really classy caps. Porcelain. <laughs> And so I went, went into Midhurst, the dentist there, and, uh, and he, so he, he had to uh, prepare the two front teeth for these beautiful porcelain caps. Uh, and uh, that took several days of, of, of quite painful kind of drilling and so forth, because uh, all the roots were exposed, because the, the roots are still good on those teeth. And I decided not to take any um, um, anesthetic just to meditate on the on the sensation. So I <coughs> you lean back in this chair and <laughs> and there's uh, Mickey Mouse, Goldilocks and Snow White on the on the ceiling. <laughs> At least I have something to look at, <laughs> and the the um, the, uh, the and then Dennis pers- and he said, uh, "Venerable Tomato, would you like some anesthetic?" I said, "No," and just and I and I concentrated on the on the sensation, and I found out that it was something I could bear, no problem. If I stayed with the sensation, 
If I started thinking about it, then I became averse to it. Because it was quite painful in that respect. But if I was just with the sensation alone, it was all right. Now that was, this is a, an experiment with, say, just going to the dentist. Just determining to, to put your attention on the sensations there rather than, than, um, uh, than, than thinking about it or worrying about it. So the feeling that we have, whether the physical or emotional feeling, if we accept those more and more, and, and actually accepting, not, not on the theoretical plane of acceptance, but the actual acceptance of receiving them in consciousness for w- as they are, allows us, to, uh, uh, allows us to bear with in a peaceful way, harmonious way, with what we might have made a problem about if we, if we didn't do this when we're looking at it from the self-view, from the ideal, from the the, uh, viewpoint and the opinion and the anxiety and the memories we have of the past. Now the the experiments with pain is uh, say as you uh, as no, say now over twenty years of meditation there is very little pain in the body. Why is that? Because in the actual because one has I've developed a practice around pain where the 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 acceptance of it allows the body to to relax. So the conditions for pain uh, begin to fade away. But even people, I'm fortunate in not having, being, not having a lot of pain, but people that do have chronic pain, if they begin to, to accept the pain, the actual sensation, and concentrate on it, they don't suffer, even though the, the, the pain, the, the sensation would be quite strong. Because suffering in this, in this respect is the reaction we have from desire. I don't want it, I don't like this, I can't stand it. This, this is suffering from desire. The actual sensation is as it is. It, it's just the way it is. And and in the moment, it changes. Pain is a very changing sensation. The vibration. Now, uh, you can do experiments in your own life, and not only here during the retreat, but when you go home, with uh, beginning to to when you do feel anxiety or worry. Go, Try to really find what it feels like in your body. Don't you know? It, it doesn't help much to analyze it, why you're frightened, because there is, being frightened is quite normal. I mean, from the ideal, you think a man, woman should never be frightened, but there's a lot to be frightened of, actually, isn't there in life? When it comes right down to the practicalities, there's a lot to be frightened of. And it's not personal, there is definitely danger in the universe. So that it's not like being neurotic and mentally ill or abnormal to be frightened. But it is to suffer from the fear by taking it all in the wrong way and not knowing what to do and suppressing it and, and creating a, uh, something complicated out of it. A whole system of defences and refusal to look and and, and the and the uh, 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 tendency to reject. All that makes makes it into a terrible, complicated, neurotic problem for us.
when you accept the feeling in the heart or in the solar plexus, you'll find that that, that uh, tends to, towards calm, towards a sense of calmness. If you hold your tension within the trunk of your body here, down here you find that one feels a, a sense of peace and calm from being there, mentally being there. At least I do, I find that. Being with the body as it is, I find calming. It's like with the sensations in my hands, with the breathing at the nostril, with the with the feelings in the heart and and in the guts. All this, even the even the uh, uh, feeling of sadness and and uh, grief and all that can be quite calming. The actual feelings, if we accept them, can be quite calming to the mind. But if we're just reacting to the feeling, then we, then we, uh, then everything becomes complicated. Everything is measured from a, from a, from a rather, uh, from a, an idea we have, a value system that we are attached to and measure everything with so that we can't ever really see things as they are because we're always criticizing it from a standard we're holding in our head of how things should be. Now the shoulds are also important. I'm putting an emphasis on feeling now, but we've been we've been conditioned with the shoulds of life. We are our culture, civilization tends to be a a should culture. And British society is full of shoulds, isn't it? What everything should be, so that. And, and should is, 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 is to have shoulds is, is, is also important, but we need to keep it in perspective as an end in itself, as an obsession of the mind. It only makes us critical, discontented, unhappy, frightened, neurotic, complicated. But as a standard to, to look to, like, a, like a, a light or a star to aim at, it, 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 it's, a, it's a light where our ideals are like lights. To, they point a direction. They give a direction to us. But we do have to be aware of how we're actually feeling. If you're going toward a light and you don't look what's in front of you, you might fall off a cliff. Step into a, a, a quicksand beaten up by a crocodile. There's so many dangerous things on the way, isn't there? Piranha fish everywhere. <laughs> and if you're just aiming for the light, you're apt to get done in by some of these things. So that you need, but you need a light too, don't you? You need, you need, the, the, but you also have to accept life the way it is at this moment. Whether if there's a pool of piranha fish in front of you, just by going to the light and saying they shouldn't be here, is done solving the problem, is it? You you find out how to get through that one or over. Whether you can leap across or whether there's a a ferry boat going <laughs> to find out. So Nibbana and the Enlightenment, these are these aren't to be despised as I as, as what we're aiming at the light the the goal for our lives for our practice. But we also have to accept the and and learn to deal with the existing hindrances the way things happen to be now that which is may not the the piranha fish. As, they, uh, as we happen to be with them at this time, with the crocodiles. 
the mosquitoes. When you're aiming at some, some, something like Nibbana, well, mosquitoes start biting you. <laughs> shouldn't be that way. There shouldn't be mosquitoes. So I used to feel that one of my great disillusionments with God was <laughs> that he should never have created mosquitoes. I think if I were God, I wouldn't have created mosquitoes. (laughs) (laughs) So I'll end end this evening's talk here and then encourage you to say this evening to to really bring uh, do anapana for say ten fifteen minutes just as a, do it like an exercise like you it, it has a very good cumulative effect over a, over a period of years because it's a very skillful thing to do but don't don't expect fantastic results all at once it's, it's uh, something that that Say you, if you do like an exercise, it, it helps. Say over a period of time, it one.